Good morning, church. Would you guys please stand up? And we're going to worship this morning.
Amen. You all may be seated for a second. Wasn't that wonderful today? Yes. Fantastic. So good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here. If it's your first time at Crossroads, I just want to say thank you for visiting with us today. If you haven't yet had a chance, we have some guest bags over at our Welcome Center, big desk in the lobby that we'd love for you to pick up. It's got some goodies in there, some gifts, just our way of saying thank you for coming to visit with us today. There were a lot of places you could have been, and we are so glad that you are here. And I know I've already talked to several first-time guests today in church. Aren't you excited to have them here with us? We have a lot of exciting stuff happening at Crossroads. If you're not aware, this coming uh, Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, this weekend is Port Orange Family Days. And so we will have a booth there. And so if you happen to be there at Port Orange Family Days, please come on by, stop by, say hi to us. It's going to be a great time. We have several of our church, uh, several of our church members who have volunteered. And for you all, thank you so much for volunteering your time to come out there. We really appreciate it. And that's going to be a wonderful way. We're going to be promoting um, the Candy Maze Walk through Bethlehem, information about our church. It's going to be such a wonderful outreach to our community. And so that's a real exciting thing we have going on this weekend. And also, because uh, we got a lot of Walk through Bethlehem news today, you got this card on your way in today. We'll start on this side here. So Walk Through Bethlehem, we have Walk Through Bethlehem construction coming up. And so if you're not familiar with Walk Through Bethlehem, it's our big Christmas outreach that we do. It's a very large Christmas drama. Thousands of people in the community come to it. It's been several years since we've been able to have it. And so but the construction is starting. If you haven't, if you haven't looked out in the field today, you notice that we've already started staking out the city and getting it ready to start putting the walls up. So it's coming soon. And so October 28th is going to be our first construction day at 8 a.m. I want to encourage you just come on out just show up you don't need to have construction experience they'll even let me out there and so just come on out it doesn't matter if you do have construction experience though please make sure you let me know we'll get you placed appropriately where we can use your skills but for the rest of us come on out we need all the hands we can get many hands make light work 8 a.m on the 28th and also if we need it november 4th we'll also have a construction day so those are our construction days. Anybody who can come out to help build the city, come on out. We'd love to have you there. Uh, and then on this side, we have different sign-ups. So several weeks ago, we had signed up for the actor positions, which has gone fantastic. We've had so many people sign up for that, and so which I'm very thankful. Thank you for all who have signed up for that. Appreciate you all so much. And so but we have other volunteer opportunities as well because there is a lot that goes into making Walk Through Bethlehem happen. So it is not just the actors, there are so many other roles as well. And so if you haven't signed up yet, I want to encourage you to look at this card and see where you can sign up. Uh, we have decorating the city. There's a lot of decorating, a lot of props that go out. We need help with that. Costumes, that's mending costumes and fixing them, as well as checking out costumes and making sure that people give our costumes back. So that's all part of that. We need a cleaning team. People come in here and make sure our auditorium looks great for the next night because this is a four-day event so we'll have people coming every single day we need people doing guest registration greeting people as they come in prayer team prayer so important we can't do walk through bethlehem in our own strength we need jesus and we need prayer we have a team of people who are dedicated to praying during walk through bethlehem so you can sign up for that parking there are no small jobs with walk through bethlehem so everything matters and Making sure we have an organized, great experience for everyone from the moment they pull onto our property is so important to us. We need people to help with parking. With the beginning of the tour, if you have been here and walked through Bethlehem before, that is when people come in through the door here, and there's a little there's a little section of lines there, and then they hand them off to the tour guide. That's that section. We need people to help with that. We need people to um, help out with the end of tour, at the end when people are getting their cookies to go around and chat with them and just talk to people. Um, we need people who can serve cookies, serve refreshments. Uh, we need people who can be ushers to help people to their seats. Um, we need, if you are still interested in acting and didn't get a chance to sign up, you can still sign up on here. We'll still take you. And so we have, a, we have what's called the What's Next table. We'll have information about the gospel, about our church, um, just for people who finish up Walk Through Bethlehem and go, well, wow, that was impactful. What do I do next? We have the answer for them. And if that's something you're interested in, you can sign up on here. And then we have child care and nursery. Now, that is for people who are volunteering for their children. 
And so if you want to help watch those kids to free up parents so that they can act in our city and serve all over during Walk Through Bethlehem, then sign up for that. But whatever you're interested in, you can fill this out, check off what you're interested in, and drop it in one of the offering boxes on your way out. And we would love to have you as a part of Walk Through Bethlehem. I know that's a lot going on, but church, aren't you excited for Walk Through Bethlehem? Yeah. Uh, all that being said now, let's stand up, turn around, uh, look for someone you don't know, greet them. And then we'll hand it back over to the band.
practice the Vedera Adavich now. <laughs> church on that day. Uh, actually, we, a month ago, we were baptizing people in the Jordan River in Israel, and then uh, <laughs> two weeks ago, we were baptizing people in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> but regardless, we're excited about what God is doing in and through Crossroads. And speaking of Israel, keep them in your prayers, please, if you haven't heard about what's going on there. They definitely can use our prayers. So thank you for being here today. Those that are watching online, those of you that are in person, we appreciate your faithfulness. What a great crowd we have here today. And you've come to hear, not from me, but you've come here to hear from the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you have God's Word, if you can open it up this morning, the Philippians chapter 2 is where we're going to be. Philippians chapter 2. And as you're doing that, I want to start off this morning by asking you a few questions. Question number one is this. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, how would you rate your relationship with your family? Don't answer that one. Because <laughs> your family member sitting next to you might not like your answer. How do you rate your relationship with your coworkers or your classmates? How do you rate your relationship with your neighbors? If you're on a team in a band, how do you rate your relationship with your teammates? You see, right now we're going through this series, and the series that we're going through is entitled this. It's all for one and one for all. That's right. And it's all about maintaining unity, maintaining unity in our relationships. And it's a takeoff from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. And we're going to study about one of those characteristics today. But essentially, what we want to do is we want to maintain unity in the relationships that we have in our home, at work, at school, in our neighborhood. We want to do those things. But the thing about it is this, is we know when there is unity in our family, for instance, it's good. Amen? Amen. The Bible says this in Psalm, verse, Psalm chapter 133. It says how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. But if there's not unity in the home, things are not so good. 
Can I get an amen to that? Amen. <laughs> when things are good in the church, when there's unity in the church, there's power in the church. We can see God work in and through the life of the church. We can see the impossible become possible. We can see walk through Bethlehem taking place after an absence of four years. We can see many people come. We can see many people hear the gospel. We can see many people trust Jesus as their Savior. When there's unity in the church, it's good. And by the way, if you haven't signed up yet, I, I encourage you to do so. Just imagine what God could do if every single person in here took that card today and checked off one of those boxes and dropped it off in the offering boxes today. Imagine what God could do through us to see people come to faith in him. It would be an awesome thing to see. You see, at the end of the day, in order for us to have unity, to maintain unity with those that we have relationships with, it takes two things. And the first thing is this. It takes love. To love one another. You see, that's what God's commanded us to do. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said these words. He says, hey, this is the way I will know if you are one of my disciples. I'll know that you are a follower of me, Jesus said, if you have love for one for another. The second essential is this. And the sec second one actually kind of feeds the first. And that is by us as believers being controlled by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have God in you. You have Christ in you. In the form of his Holy Spirit. And the Bible says because of his Holy Spirit that is in you, it will cause us to live out what's called the fruit of the Spirit. And because of the fruit of the, the Spirit that, that is manifested in your life, it will cause you to walk together with those at home, those at work, those at school, those others in your life. It will cause you to walk together in love and joy and peace but when you're not walking in the spirit that's when you find yourself complaining criticizing speaking negatively about others sowing discord and by the way can I say this if you ever encounter someone that's speaking negatively to you about others Beware, because they're probably speaking negatively about you to others. Come on. So I've learned, if I hear somebody that's speaking negatively, that's sowing discord, I've learned to do this. <laughs> Either you leave or allow them to leave. You see, that's not maintaining unity. That's causing division. You see? The Bible says that we, as believers in Jesus, should be maintaining unity in our relationships, regardless of where those occur. That's what God desires in our life. But keeping unity isn't a given. It doesn't happen automatically. It's something that God desires in our life to do, but we sometimes have to, to work at it. But within ourselves and within the Holy Spirit that God has placed us, placed within us, we have characteristics. And one of those characteristics that's talked about in Ephesians 4.2, we're going to elaborate on today in Philippians chapter 2, that's within the Christian that will help us to maintain unity with those that are in our life, those that we interact with on a regular basis. So that way, again, the goal is for us to walk together in love and in peace and in harmony. How many of you guys desire to have lives that are full of love, peace, and harmony? Amen? Amen. How many of you guys love lives that are full of unrest and chaos? <laughs> Nobody. We don't like that. So that's our desire. And today we're studying about the very first characteristic of a Christian that will help us to be more like Christ. That will help us to facilitate harmony and love and fellowship with our loved ones. And that's humility. 
Humility is defined as this. It's defined as putting others ahead of yourself and not taking the credit for something. You know, humility is one of those things that you can't really brag about having. <laughs> the word originally in its Greek form was never found in secular writing. It was a word that was first coined by Christians. You see, Romans and Greeks, they had no concept of humility. To them, the person that placed, that placed others ahead of themselves was seen as a coward, and it was unnatural to do so. So they looked at anyone that was humble as weak. So when Paul wanted a word to describe the humble person, Paul had to create a word, the word that's used for humble, translated humble in your Bible. You see, the world might look at humility as a weakness, but it's the most fundamental of the Christian virtues. And the reason for it is this, is without humility, we can never be like Christ. And the Bible encourages us as, as believers to be conformed to the image of his, of his son. In Philippians chapter 2 here, we see the perfect picture of humility. And it features Jesus Christ. But before we read this, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about if you've ever considered the humility of Jesus. That he left the glory of heaven surrounded by a multitude of angels that were bowing and worshiping him to come from heaven to earth and become one of us. That required humility to be despised, to be rejected, to be crucified, to be killed. That required humility, the utmost of humility. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you all, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Notice this closely in verse number six. It says, and being found in the form of a man, a human being, he what? Humbled himself. And became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. And we're going to see this concept in Scripture that when we're humbled, that's really in God's eyes when we're exalted. God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Being humble is being Christ-like. Humility is the opposite of pride. Pride is defined as a high opinion of one's own self. Seeing your own importance, your own superiority, whether as cherished in your mind or as displayed in your conduct. Pride is essentially thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. I have it on the screen for you. Paul says, for, for I say, through the grace that was given to me, and Paul could really understand grace as we should. He said, to every man, every man, every man, that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, accordingly as God hath dealt to every man the measure of grace. You see, the center of pride is me. The middle letter in the word of pride is I. When I think about pride, I realize that pride is something that encompasses our world today. And it's an attitude that can infiltrate our lives. So we've got to be careful because when we think about pride and what it has caused, even in the past, pride <clears throat> was something at the very beginning that was in the heart of the very first sin. There was someone in the Bible by the name of Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan, the devil. And we read in the book of Isaiah these words that were recorded. In chapter 14. And Satan said this. He said, I will be like the most high God. 
I will exalt my throne. I will. I will. I will. The very first sin by a human being, Adam and Eve. God gave them clear commands and read about them in Scripture, Genesis chapter 3. He created for them the perfect utopia, heaven on earth. We call it the Garden of Eden. And he said these words to them. He said, look at this beautiful garden I've given you. Out of every tree in the garden, thou may freely eat. But of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. They're looking at that tree. Cody, you're the tree. <laughs> Can you be a tree? Let's hear it for Cody. <laughs> that tree looks pretty good. The fruit in that tree. <laughs> I better stop there. You're not the tree. <laughs> it looked good to be desired. I think I will eat of that fruit from that tree. And I will. Pride. Pride doesn't end well. In Proverbs chapter 16, most of us know this verse. It says, pride goeth before destruction. <laughs> pride doesn't end well. As long as we're in this flesh, as long as we, we are in these bodies, we're going to battle pride. Satan will ever be seeking to cause us to seek ways Again, maybe not intentionally, to rob God of his glory by exalting ourselves. Pride. Pride might be entering into our life and we don't even know it. And we've got to be careful. And I'm going to tell you about some things, some ways for us to be able to notice if pride is a problem in our life. How many of you remember this uh, comedian? He's still around the name. His name is Jeff Foxworthy. Y'all remember him? He was the guy that would say, hey, you might be a redneck if your home has wheels and your cars don't. <laughs> or you might be a redneck if turtleneck is an ingredient in your soup. <laughs> that was that guy. Hilarious. But I'm going to word it similar to that. You might have a problem with pride if, number one, you're unthankful. You see... If we're unthankful, sometimes we think that we only deserve that which is good. But we see in the life of Christ that what happened in his life and what happens in our life sometimes is not always good. But the end result is good. Amen? And sometimes it's hard as we're going through a life to see that. But we, we've got to make sure that as we're going through the fires in our life, we know who controls the temperature. <laughs> Amen? Sometimes in our life we might be unthankful because we don't put two and two together. We don't realize that every good and perfect gift is from God. above, from God. And it comes from the Father and Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Secondly, is this you might have a problem with pride if you enjoy being the topic of conversation. And what I mean by that is this, is that sometimes it reminds me of this cartoon of Garfield. Garfield is talking to Odie the dog, and he tells Odie this. He says, Odie, I'm tired of talking about me. You talk about me for a while. I want someone to talk about me. And sometimes we're me-centric. It's got to be about You might have a problem with pride if you're not listening very well. And what I mean by that is this. You're engaged in a conversation with someone that you're trying to maintain relationship with, maintain unity with. But when you're engaged in that conversation, as they're talking, you're thinking about the next thing you want to say. And how does that come across to the person opposite you? It comes across this way, that what you have to say is more important than what they're saying. Pride. You might have a problem with pride if 
you're not being teachable. When you come to the point where you think, I already know it all. I don't need to listen to you. You need to listen to Right. I confess. I confess that I have had or I'm still having a problem with at least one or more of those things we just mentioned. Because pride is a problem that we are going to continue to have until we are delivered from these bodies. Paul said this in Romans chapter 7 verse 25. He says, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Pride is something that is difficult to see in ourselves. We can see it in other people, but it's impossible to see in ourselves. Why? Because it's not something we're looking for. How often do we ask ourselves at the end of the day, oh, how have I been prideful today? Let me count thy ways. We don't do that, do we? But the problem is this, is that the pride, as we've seen, is at the heart of all sin and all of our problems in human relationships. It's the reason disunity and fractures occur in the relationships that we have are mainly because of pride. This passage today that we are looking at in Philippians chapter 2 is, it's not about pride. It's about the polar opposite of pride, which is humility. Humility. And when you reach the place where you think you are humble, then you probably just lost it. Humility is something that we will never see in ourselves, but it will be something that others see in our lives when it's there. When they mention it, the truly humble person, they won't see it because they're incapable of acknowledging it. They won't confirm. If, the, if a humble person you know, is told that they're being humble, they're not going to reply back and say, you're right, I am humble. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You won't hear those words come out of their mouth. But humility is something that we all need. Again, it's the most Christ-like quality that we should have and display in our life to maintain unity in our relationships. But how do we do that? True humility involves these two essential components. Number one, it involves a proper view of oneself, a proper view of yourself. The truly humble person will see himself as he really is. And he will, he or she will do this in three ways. Number one, the genuinely humble person knows and confesses that they are a sinner. 1 John chapter 1 says these words. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive who? Ourselves. Ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. You see, the genuinely humble person acknowledges and confesses that they're not perfect, that they do make mistakes, that they're a sinner. But they also don't compare themselves to other human beings. To them, the measuring stick is God. You see, this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, check out this verse here. It says, for we dare not count or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. They who measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another are not, are not wise. It's not a competition, and I'm not against competition. Competition's great in sports and band and other Then Yes, competition is great, but in the Christian life, it's not a competition. Don't compare yourself with other people. The genuinely humble person realizes that everything that they have has been given to them by the Lord. I love this verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible says this, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to take credit for anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from who? It's from God. Amen. And that's why you hear the humble person that receives a compliment. 
and you don't hear them again say, you're right. You don't see them patting themselves on the back. What you see them do is this. They point up. They say things like, praise the Lord. God is good. They take the focus off of themselves and they render honor unto whom honor is due. A great musician was asked one day which instrument was the most difficult to play. He replied, second fiddle. Come on. Humility requires us to play second fiddle, which is difficult for some because we've been coached to be this strong, self-sufficient, independent person that creates their own destiny. But God wants us to play second fiddle. You see, not only does true humility involve us to have a proper view of ourself, but number two, it requires us to have a proper view of God. The truly humble person sees God, God, God is the source of all your ability. God is the source of all your blessing. God is the source of all your success. Amen? Amen. The truly person sees God as who he is. He sees God as the almighty. God is the all-powerful. God is the all-knowing. God, God, the awareness that God has and who God is causes the humble person to respond in ways that demonstrate their humility. That it's not about them, but it's about him. John the Baptist was a great example of that. He wanted to make sure that he didn't take the credit. Give God the credit. When people bowed down after Paul stuck his hand in the fire and got bit by that snake, and the people there in Malta started to revere him as a god, Paul was like, eh, eh, don't bow down and worship me. Worship God. When people were bowing down and trying to worship Peter, and Peter says, get up off your feet, because I'm a like man just as you. Worship God. You see, in the Old Testament, we see so many examples of this in which people, they saw God, they had a proper view of God. Because they had a proper view of God, they had a proper view of himself. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, and this, this passage in Scripture still gets me. When Isaiah said these words in Isaiah 6, 5, he was in the presence of God. And he says, woe is me, God. I am a man with unclean lips. And I dwell among unclean people, unholy people. He says, for my eyes have seen you. <laughs> you are the king of kings and the Lord of hosts. The apostle Paul, as wretched as he was as an unbeliever, to hunt down Christians, jail them. On his way to do that very thing in Damascus, he came face to face with the light of the world, Jesus. With the resurrected, ascended Christ. And when he saw Jesus, the Bible says that his life was changed forever. And he saw himself as he really was. Because he saw God as far as who he was. He later wrote these words in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says, this is a faithful saying. Paul saying, hey, you can believe this. I've seen this with my own eyes. I've experienced this in my life. It's a faithful saying, and it's worthy of all acceptance. What is it, Paul, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst? Paul saw who Jesus was, and it caused him to see who he was. Simon Peter, man. When he saw God and who he was, he recognized again his own sin. In Luke chapter 5, verse number 8, the Bible says when Simon Peter saw Jesus, he fell down at Jesus' feet. And he said, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinner. Job, the Old Testament saint, went through so much tragedy in his life. But then he came into the presence of the Lord. And when he did, and he saw God for what, 
for who God is and compared to who he is, these were his words. He says, I abhor myself, for I am a sinner, and I repent. You see, the fact of the matter is this, is the truly humble person, they understand that God is God. God is perfect. God is holy. God is righteous. But God still accepts us. <laughs> Amen? In spite of all of our faults, in spite of all of our failures, in spite of all of our sin, God says, hey, come unto me, all you that labor, and I will give you rest. God loves us, and he's willing to forgive us. And that's a humbling truth. In your Bible, I want you to turn to one other passage today before we read, and that's Luke chapter 18. If you could turn back a few books to Luke chapter 18. And we've got to understand that we must all come to the place where we understand that God is not impressed with our fame, what we've done, where we've been. All that doesn't matter a whole lot to God. What God is most interested in is this. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in your heart. In Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 9, we see a picture of this. It says, Jesus told this parable or this story to some who trusted in themselves as though they were righteous and they despised others. Verse 9, verse 10. And then he goes on to tell the story. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed these things about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Again, comparison. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I tithe of all that I earn. But notice what Jesus says here in verse 13. He says, but the tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. He saw who he was. <laughs> he had the proper view of himself and the proper view of God. It says this. It says he struck his chest, saying, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus says these words. He says, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. exalted. That's the truth of Luke 18. That's to be driven home in our hearts today. Everyone that exalts himself, Jesus' words will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And isn't that what we saw in Philippians chapter 2 in the life of Jesus from the words of God? He had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is we're talking about humility today. We're talking about pride because it affects our ability to live the Christian life and maintain unity with those closest to us. Pride will cause me to live if my ways are right. But humility will cause me to live as if God's ways are right. When I walk in pride, I do what I please, when I please, with whom I please. And I have to get my way or it's the highway. <laughs> But when I'm humble, I do what he pleases, when he pleases. And I don't have to get my way as long as I'm going God's way. Mm -hmm. Pride and humility also affect the way that we function, again, together with our loved ones, with our families, with those closest to us. When I walk in pride, I'm going to demand my own way. And I'll be offended when I don't get my way. However, when I'm walking in humility, I realize that it's not all about me. I will realize that everything is about the glory of God. Remember that last part of that passage in Philippians 2. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. That's why. You see, when I'm walking in humility, I will look for ways to honor God with my words. And with my walk, with my life, I won't give in to criticizing. I won't give in to complaining. 
I won't give in to negativity. I won't give in to defiance and division. I will yield myself to the Spirit of God. Why? Because I'm trusting in Him to lead me in a way to where I can be encouraging, supportive, cooperative, loving, peaceful, humble with other people. While God stands firmly against pride, we've seen that in Scripture, He has promised to bless the humble. James chapter 4, verse 6 on the screen. It says, God resists the pride. Get away from me. But he gives grace to the humble. The next verse on the screen says this from 1 Peter 5, 6. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. Humility is simply this. Humility is when we lose ourselves in him. Because that's when he can start using us. When Jesus spoke of that second commandment, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that he said that because we have a little problem loving ourselves. He knew that the true challenge and the test was to love others at that same level. We must ask the Lord to help us to develop true humility of heart. So that way, nothing matters more to us than the will of God and his glory. The church won't be perfect because it's made up of imperfect people. Amen? Amen. Your family won't be perfect. Your place of employment won't be perfect. Your school won't be perfect. Your team won't be perfect. And by the way, if you are in abusive situation at school, at work, at home, don't stay in that situation. There's always a way out. But if we have humility and we have love for one another, it will do much to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Amen? Amen. I'm going to close with this illustration on the screen. It's a picture of a young lady. Her name is Melissa. She went home to be with the Lord at the young age of 17. Huge softball star. And in order to honor her memory, her school did a wonderful thing. They were in the process of building a new athletic field, and they honored her by naming the sports field after her. And they had a stone that was engraved that had Melissa's life verse engraved on it, the verse that she lived by. And this famous, huge teenage softball star's life verse was Ephesians 4.2. And the words engraved on that stone were, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. True greatness does not come to those who strive for worldly fame. It lies instead with those who choose to serve in Jesus' name. Be humble and you will not stumble. You see, when we walk in humility, it will help us to maintain unity, yes. But God will be pleased. And God will be glorified in your life. Amen. Amen. With all heads bowed and with all eyes closed, as we reflect on the message from God's word today, what you've heard from in these passages in your Bible and on the screen are words from God. They're words that God wants to use to help you in your daily life, to encourage you to know that you can do all things through Christ. I started off by asking a question, and the question was, how would you rate from 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest your relationship with others? And I'll conclude with that same question, but this time, how do you rate your relationship with God? You see, if you're here today, and you don't have a relationship with Him, God desires a relationship with you. He loved you so much that He sent His Son to this earth to be despised, to be rejected, to be crucified out of love for you so you can be forgiven of your sins and one day be able to join him in that perfect paradise in heaven. Christian, if you're here today, I encourage you. Have that proper view of yourself and that will enable you to have that proper view of God. 
Give glory to whom glory is due. Give honor to whom honor is due. The one true God. His name is Jesus. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, humble before you because of what you've done for us. Lord, we were lost without hope in our sin, in a world of darkness. But you sent your Son, the light of the world, to rescue us and give us a bright future. Lord, you love us, and we love you. Lord, we pray for those that are here today that might not know you, that they'll come to the knowledge of the truth, that you love them and you gave yourself for them. We pray for them now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you don't have that relationship with him, we encourage you to come and talk to us. We're available here. You can come during the last song, come after the song, either to the front. We always have people available in our reception room down below. Come and talk to them. We'd be glad to help you in your relationship with God. If you're here today and you need prayer about something going on in your life, again, please come see us. We're here for you. We love you. Thanks for being here today. Would you please stand and join our team here as we conclude with this song based on what Christ has done for us. There's power in the blood. Amen? Amen. All right. Get ready to start clapping those hands.